My name is James Button. I'm a former journalist and public servant, and I'm chairing these webinars. Today, we're going to be discussing the issue of how to lead with humility. It's an interesting question. In, in these webinars, we've been talking a lot about different ways of governing, especially in our relationships with the people whom government is supposed to represent. So what does it mean to lead with humility? Isn't that a contradiction in terms? To answer that question, we've got a terrific panel here. Peter Hughes is the chair of ANZOG and he is the director of um, state services in New Zealand. He's had a long career in public service in New Zealand, including being secretary of the education department. Mary Wooldridge is a former minister here in Victoria. And Mary was minister for mental health, community services and women's affairs between uh, in, in the time of the, um, the, the Bailey and Napthine governments here in Victoria. And Sandra Parker is the Fair Work, is Australia's Fair Work Ombudsman. I'm gonna start by asking you, Mary, to if, if you could answer that question. You, you have a political background. So what, let's talk about it from, we haven't had somebody who's been in politics before in these webinars. So Mary, perhaps you could start by telling us what you think needs to change in government so that uh, people can lead with humility. Thanks very much, James, and, and hello to everyone. Um, it's a very uh, challenging question and certainly from a political perspective. Um, when I think about politics um, and especially being a member of parliament, I often think of it as a uh, like snakes and ladders uh, where the ladders are very short and the snakes are very long. Um, in, in the corporate world, if you hit 80% of your KPIs mm. and, and miss 20, you're probably uh, congratulated and get a bonus. Uh, in government, if you hit 98% of them, you get absolutely slaughtered for the 2% that you miss. And so um, there's a very high aversion to risk. Uh, and there's also a, a very, I think, close holding of uh, power and decision making. And for me, one of the things about leading with hum humility is actually uh, sharing that power, sharing the decision making, uh, sharing um, the process of deciding what needs to do. Now, in a crisis, it's been interesting. We've seen from a lot of our political leaders uh, a lot of comments where we're moving quickly, we're not going to get it all right uh, all of the time. And I think the public has some sympathy and understanding of that, uh, given the context that we're in currently. Um, so I think we've got to try and translate uh, some of that understanding of the capacity that, that sometimes mistakes will happen, that we will learn from them and improve from them um, into a political environment, um, which is hard with a very aggressive media and opposition. So, um, but I think the public can drive it. I think if the community is saying we want our leaders to um, innovate, we want them to engage us, we want them to... Um, uh, share some of, uh, be much more open and honest and transparent in relation to decisions that are made and, and that we can be part of those decisions, then I think we can start to shift that dial of uh, political leaders being prepared to um, uh, open up and, and uh, be more humble in terms of their decision making and in terms of their leadership approach. A fantastic answer. Thanks, Mary. And I, I want to come back to you to talk about this question a bit later about the 98% success not being enough and the 2% being the bit that gets you clobbered. But Peter, picking up on what Mary said, um, is it possible that in a time of crisis like now, and you're right at the centre of, of the New Zealand response, that a time of crisis can actually uh, induce leaders to, to lead more with humility, to be more comfortable in leading with humility than they might in in so-called normal times. Um, sure, thanks, James. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa, um, g'day everybody. Um, absolutely, because for me, it comes back to why we're all here. You know, so to an extent, um, we're here to pay the mortgage, but we choose to do that by being here and not there. Um, and for me, that all comes back to what I call the spirit of service. So. Right now, I'm sitting in a room and I'm looking out over our parliament, and in the parliament, they are debating the third reading of the Public Service Bill, which is a 
huge big uh, reform of the public service, biggest in 30 years. Um, and one of the really great things about the reform is I think it, it, it hooks into the spirit of service, why public servants are public servants. And I'm just going to read to you one of the clauses in the bill, and um, it says simply this. Public service leaders must preserve, protect, and nurture the spirit of service to the community that public service employees bring to their work. So um, the public service is not like the private sector. We're here because we choose to serve. We're here because we choose to serve. And if you're able to hook into that and give expression to that, then magical things happen. Um, and actually, a lot of that quite often is just getting out of the way. Um, so right now in this COVID crisis, uh, people are really clear about the objective um, and that spirit of service is really <clears throat> coming to the fore. Um, and we've cleared away the rule book, we've cleared away all of that stuff and we are letting people get on with it and give full expression to their spirit of service. So for me, it comes back to the spirit of service. Let's, well, I want to come back to the spirit of service a bit later and get you to talk a bit more deeply about it, but I'd like to bring in Sandra here. Sandra, you, what are your responses to that question that was asked in the poll? What do you think needs to change? You, you have long experience in government uh, to ensure that people do lead with humility. And I might get you also to reflect on the current moment as well, whether you, you also see a different difference in the times we're in now. Mm, yeah, thanks, James, and hi, everyone. Um, I've, I think the current crisis, the, the COVID crisis, if you like, has um, given, it should have given everybody a fair bit of hope here. You've seen, we've seen for the first time in probably a long time where our leaders are listening to the science and they're listening to, they're taking health advice. Uh, they're not thinking they have to run it all themselves. Uh, and they're really, really focused on the public interest. And um, in Australia, the sharing of cabinet, getting state governments and Commonwealth in the room together, working through the issues uh, with each other and, and with obviously with the health leadership has been really inspiring and the public's really responded to that. Um, you know, one of the things I think as public servants we need to be constantly asking ourselves is what's the public interest? And we need to be really focused on not on private vested interest or political interests or public pressure, but often um, it's about simply saying what's the right thing to do? Putting the filter of that over everything we do is really important. So an example of that, you know, to be a good regulator, which is what I, my job is at the moment, there are a whole lot of things you need to do, not only be consciously thinking what's the public interest, and that changes even as a regulator with legislation, you still have to be very conscious of the public interest at a particular time. And so, but part of the, part of the job is things like practical things, keeping the minister informed, but don't ask, don't ask them what you should be doing you know, saying no when ministers ask you to appear with them at press conferences, you know, turning down industry lunches and events, you know, that whole thing about being apolitical. But a big thing for me is to be prepared to change your approach when the public interest changes. So COVID is a classic example. Our approach in regulation has changed quite a bit during COVID. There is no point in me as a regulator going out and smashing up businesses that are really, really struggling. Uh, what we need to do is obviously deal with the egregious stuff and where people are getting ripped off or underpaid, absolutely. Uh, but also helping businesses. We've got to really help them. We don't want them going out of business. Uh, so it's all of those kind of factors of consulting, being conscious of what, what context you operate in and being prepared to listen and hear from other people about uh, what they think the best approach is as well. You see a kinder uh, approach to government at this time, Sandra. Is that what you're saying? I mean, this need, you, you talk about the need to understand it from the business perspective, the, the, the pressures they're under right now. That, 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 I that's... think it's huge. And I think part of it is that they are forced, they're being forced to admit that they don't have all the answers and that the public wants them to, to follow the science and follow, um, you know, just talk to other people and, you know, be much more engaged with the community. Everybody's nervous and fearful. And, you know, of course they want their leaders to be strong and to lead, but they also want them to listen. 
And so making big speeches isn't what we need at the moment. That's really interesting. Mary, already in the chat, there's been two comments about the role of media. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested to hear from you as a, as a former minister. Obviously, humility, a key uh, feature of humility is being able to admit when you make mistakes. But that's almost impossible in politics, isn't it, to, to stand up and say, we got it wrong, we're going to have another crack. I think it is exceptionally hard. And I, I think the media has an absolutely critical role here um, to move from the gotcha moments to a broader context. And what I've certainly seen, um, you know, especially at a state level, although I think it's happening federally as well, is um, we're getting much more into reporting the activity of the day um, or the, the, the hot topic rather than having a look at the broader picture. And I found it very hard um, to talk about policy themes and what we were trying to achieve and outcomes um, and, and, a, and a pathway to achieving them um, versus whatever, you know, the, the, the issue of, was of, of the day. Um, so, you know, that's, and when I've thought about how do, you, how do you shift the media, I mean, they're under intense pressure. They often don't have short deadlines, you know, high reporting requirements rather than think time. Um, but I think it's also about, um, you know, the readership um, pushing back a bit on that and saying, you know, it's not just the, the gotcha moment. Um, we do want more thoughtful um, analysis. We want to understand the broader context um, and the capacity to push back on that. I think the other thing that we're seeing being limited more and more is um, fora for um, that sort of political debate and discussion that's, that's deeper than just the moment. I mean, we've lost the, the state lines and the 730 Victorias and those sorts of things, that, you know, especially at a state level where so many of the services directly affect and have an impact on people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, our capacity in any long format to discuss any issue is almost zero. Um, so, you know, I think, I think the community needs to um, help in demanding that. Um, we need to create more for her and, you know, Anzog's a perfect um, opportunity, an example of, of how that can be done or the Centre for Social Impact, those sort of groups, where we can, where we can have those deeper discussions and that's welcomed. Um, rather than just the gotcha moment. Thanks, Mary. Peter or Sandra, I'm going to ask one of you to jump in first and respond to what Mary said, particularly in terms of the media, but also yeah. um, I'd be interested in your perspective on how social media has changed the game, game for you. Um, and uh, one, if, if one of you jumps in, then the other one, please come in after that. Sure. Um, James, I think communication's absolutely, absolutely key. I often say, um, communication is the oxygen of leadership. And for me, um, key to communication is authenticity. Uh, and, you know, with all communications not polished these days, it's real time and it's live, and particularly with social media. Um, and it's almost as if people can see into your soul. And the leaders that are most effective are those that communicate really well and those that are authentic. Um, so I think one of the big things um, for those of us who are public service leaders uh, is actually to understand that and to learn how to lead out of our own personalities with authenticity. You know, it's almost like um, we kind of get trained to do the reverse. I, I think most people know how to lead. We all do that in our lives. You know, uh, we lead in families, we lead in the community, we lead in a variety of settings, but when we come to work, we kind of hang all that up on the peg at the door and we become managers and we start to behave in really strange ways. And if we can find ways of reconnecting um, with our own personality and learn to lead with authenticity and integrity, um, that for me is absolutely at the core of it. Uh, and people will see that uh, with the way that the media works uh, today, they will absolutely see that. Can I, can I just ask there, because Sandra, you said um, you didn't think, you know, public servants should be speaking at industry lunches and engaging, um, whereas for me, I, you know, I would disagree with that. I actually think, um, and a bit to Peter's point about showing the leadership, um, the engagement of public sector leaders with broader communities, um, I think is absolutely crucial. The important aspect of it is not doing it in a non-political way. Uh, yes, yes. Because I do think some public servants do say, you know, it's not my role. I'm not going to be, you know, um, out there 
uh, promoting issues, but in terms of the explanation and the understanding and the engagement of the community with um, policies or policy development, I think it's vital. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So when I'm talking about industry lunches, it's the, it's the non-engagement one. It's the being asked out by the legal firm uh, to have, a, you know, a, an expensive lunch or they send us tickets to things all the time. It's, it's the stuff that enables you to be influenced, I guess, is what I was talking about there. I mean, one of the things I think is really important too is developing a set of principles. Peter talked about authenticity. I think it's also about transparency. So one of the things um, we've done in the Fair Work Ombudsman is to develop a, a set of principles to decide on how we approach enforcement. And part of my job is to, is to stick to those and defend them, even when you've got media and some commentators in the community who are screaming for you know, public hangings. I mean, we've had um, a situation in Australia where we had the Hain Royal Commission into the banking sector and after that there was just this loud commentary on regulators aren't tough enough, they have to go harder, they have to, you know, they're weak, they, they need to be doing a lot more. They, the, the terminology of wage theft has become a really big part of the lexicon. Uh, it would be very easy for me and, and with my agency to be pushing us into going really hard, making big bold statements about how we won't tolerate and how we need to do these things, dragging everyone off to court. Um, that is not always in the public interest. Part of uh, what we have to do is hold firm on a set of principles about what's the right thing to do, what's the balanced approach to regulation, uh, and to stick with that even when you're getting uh, told that you are weak and not doing your job well enough. So being able to defend and as I said before, you have to keep coming back to that question, what's in the public interest? And that will change at various times. And you've got to be really cognizant of the noise around some of that. But the question I ask all the time and I get my people to ask all the time is what's the right thing to do? And often it's kind of obvious when you stand back from the noise. I think there's a real theme developing here. Let's go back to Peter's comment about um, if leadership is linked to being able to be your own person in the role and to, to find your own personality, uh, to act with authenticity. I think that's a really interesting uh, vein for, to hear from all three of you, because surely, Peter, it's harder now, isn't it, in the, in the media and public environment uh, we're operating in, to be your own person is probably in some ways harder than ever. And we hear these complaints that politicians are like robots, you know, that they don't speak, um, in a human way. And that part of that surely is the pressures they're on, the media pressures. Um, so I'm just really interested to, to get your thoughts on the operating environment, if you like. Surely that makes it, you're absolutely right, I'm sure, about what's needed, but, but it, isn't it harder than ever? Um, look, I, I, just, I, just, I just think people can, you know, with the way the media works, people can, can read whether or not you're being authentic or scripted very quickly. Um, and, and what they want is integrity and leadership. You know, I absolutely um, agree with Sandra. What people want is integrity and leadership. And that's a question I often ask around here is what is the right thing to do? Because you can get lost in the media advice and the management advice and the, uh, legal advice. You can absolutely get lost in your potential to lose the plot on things as fast. What people want to see is integrity and leadership and they want to see people trying to do the right thing. And it doesn't matter that it's not polished um, or it's not deft. If they see you're trying to do it, they will respond to that, I think, very strongly. Mary, what do you think? I think you've just got to look at the um, opinion polls of our um, PM and, and our premiers. I mean, they're through the roof. Uh, Mark McGowan's on 89% approval or, uh, you know, it's something incredible and, and to varying degrees. Now, some of um, that's changed a little bit in Victoria, given what's happened. But I think um, these environments do allow people to um, 
be themselves to, to respond in a, in a very human way to, to what's happening, um, to be open about, back to that issue about admitting there'll be mistakes, but it, it's not going to be perfect, but we're working really hard and we're trying hard. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that idea of empathy coming through and, and connectedness. Um, and I think one of our challenges is how do we translate how people have responded in this very human way to the current COVID crisis um, into other aspects uh, of, um, uh, of policy and, and political and uh, media representation. And perhaps so, you know, so I, Jane, I, James, on the issue, I just want to come back to um, Mary's comments about risk and mistakes, because I think it's really important for a public sector audience in my experience, like people don't want perfection, but they do want accountability. Mm. And so uh, what I say to the secretaries here is, you know, you don't need to be perfect. You don't need to get it right every time, but you do need to be accountable. So the mantra here is own it, fix it, learn from it and stand up, be accountable. And um, my experience of that is people are extraordinarily generous. If you do that, it takes some bravery um, but people are extraordinarily generous if you do that. If you duck and dive and run for cover, that's when you get into trouble. So, you know, again, it comes back to integrity and authenticity um, and honest communication. And, and those, those... I think the point is probably to make sure you don't make the same mistake twice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's pretty tough to say. We've made the same mistake again, but we'll definitely get it right the third time. Well, that's, <laughs> you back know. To humility, Peter. I mean, I think the question is, is, is part of this, uh, I mean, can you give examples? Have you stood up and said, look, I got that wrong. Um, I made a mistake, uh, or we made a mistake, and, and we're, this is how we're going to fix it. Have you done yeah. that? Yeah, no, we do that all the time. I mean, this is, this is the public service. We've got tens of thousands of people you know, getting out of bed every day, coming to work, doing their best to make a difference. Um, and they're human beings, they make mistakes. Um, it's, it's when you try and cover it up or hide it, or, you know, the media's only got 10% of what's gone wrong and you don't, you don't come honest about the remaining 90% that you get in, into difficulty. Um, they want, people want somebody to stand up and say, this happened, I own it, I'm gonna fix it and we'll learn from it. We won't do it again. So that, you know, you do the same mistake again twice. Um, well, that's a worry. Three times it's a trend, you're in serious trouble. Um, so you can't do that. Um, but people want honesty and accountability. They're sick of people ducking and diving and spinning and running for cover and, you know, pointing at other people. Thanks, Peter. Sandra, what are your thoughts on that? And can you give examples of how you've actually, in a sense, how your personality, how you've how you use that in the public sphere to, uh, to to get the result that you wanted? Yeah, I think um, I think the authenticity and the um, being uh, willing to be held accountable is really important. One of the things that we do is, and it sounds a bit trite, but it's it, it works really well. Is you really have to consult with stakeholders, even when you are a regulator, you need to have the trust of those you regulate. So in that sense, talking to employers, talking to employees, talking to small business, talking to the stakeholders that represent them and even your own staff. So one of the things that we do, we've started to do is set a, you know, set of annual priorities around what we will proactively regulate for the year, you know, based on intelligence, et cetera, but it's also based on talking to stakeholders about what they think is important, where they see the risks in the community, where they think we should be putting our efforts. And as I said, talking to staff about that as well, your own staff have a really good sense of what they think the important work is that you should be doing and consulting with them as much as the community is really, really important. So with all of that, you can then stand up and say, we've been talking to people, we've been you know, asking them what we should be putting our discretionary effort on. And they've provided this input and we're listening and also to be prepared to alter that. So during COVID, we've had to say, well, I'll drop some of the priorities we had. COVID has to be a priority. It's got to be about assisting people through this crisis. We've also got a role in regulating JobKeeper, the, uh, you know, the wage subsidy program. And so we've got to focus in on all of those things. But on the other hand, we've got, you know, we have other priorities. So as I said, just keeping 
a really close eye on what's changing and happening. And that's where I keep coming back to the public interest. It changes when things change in the community. It's fascinating how such a difficult issue as COVID opens up possibilities for governing in a different way. And all, all of you are talking about that. Um, if, if, you're, if you're on the call, feel free to share your thoughts in chat, ask questions. I'll start reflecting those thoughts and questions back to our panelists in the next 10 minutes before we go to groups. Mary, let me, let me ask you, did you see much humility in politics? Yeah, and look, there's there's all sorts of levels <clears throat> from my perspective of humility. There's there's your personal behaviour in in terms of um, or how you come across publicly. You know, respect for others, empathy, um, your capacity to listen, learn, uh, act, uh, and respond to to what's going on, both both in your own personal behaviours, but also in how you determine policy and put it in place. Um, and then, of course, bring people together to, to share power and decision making. And, and I think that um, further down that uh, continuum is harder um, in politics, as I, as I talked about earlier. But you see, um, I think, quite a lot and, and more so of those um, earlier characteristics in terms of empathy, respect, um, and listening, learning and responding um, all the time and, and it is reinforced now. I think the thing that's interesting for political leaders is, you know, people get pre-selected, people get elected on the basis of uh, a track record of success, self-confidence, you know, having all the answers um, and then we're actually saying, no, we want you to uh, be different to that. Um, and so the more we can have these discussions, the more we can value in, um, you know, in public sector, private sector, uh, humility and leadership, uh, empathy and leadership, um, you know, the more hopefully that we can incorporate that into our expectations of, um, of politicians as well. Um, but I think uh, there's still a a fair way to go. Um, and just one example, and you know, there's a question there about examples as well. I think um, Jacinta Ardern is, a, is an interesting uh, case study in this context because she's seen as a very empathetic leader. Um, she has faced, you know, between, um, you know, the shootings in Christchurch, the volcano, um, and now COVID, um, in, a, in a relatively short period, been to see, is, is seen really as, perhaps one of the best leaders in the world. Um, and that's mainly that face of being, of her empathy, of her kindness, um, of her capacity to connect and listen and, and respond to those around her rather than, um, you know, come in, uh, you know, uh, and, and control the situation. Um, and so I think she's a really interesting example of how that's worked. And I did see an interview with her where someone asked about her pathway to leadership and what characterised it. And she actually said kindness and empathy. Now, I don't think you'd hear that from any other political leader. Um, you'd go back to that track record of success and ability to make decisions and, and change things. Um, and the more we have role models of people being successful in that capacity, um, the more I think it will be valued and more people will, will be able to um, articulate their own capacity in that regard. And Mary, those crises have been the making of her, haven't they? I mean, it's, it, it, she's, you would never wish on anyone that those crises had, had happened, but they have enabled her to show that side of her, uh, of her character more clearly, perhaps, uh, because, because they were called them. Oh, very, very much so. And I think it's put her on a world stage like no other. The interesting thing is when I thought through the next level, I don't have a sense and, um, you know, the New Zealanders will have a much closer perspective on this, but I don't have a sense of, you know, has she delivered on her policies? Has she, um, you know, uh, you know how, how things are going more broadly? But she has a very high worldwide profile um, because of her capacity to have empathy um, in crisis situations. Thanks, Mary. Peter, let me ask you, um, how do you think, we've got a question from Amy who, who asks, um, how do you think government and politics will change permanently as a result of the changes we've seen from COVID? And I might direct this back to your points also about personality and authenticity in, in, in government as well. Um, I guess we ask this question each time and um, there is a crisis and 
you know, to an extent, we do go back to doing things the way we're used to doing them. But I like to think each time we kind of inch forward a little bit. Like in New Zealand, um, I'm just hugely proud of the public service response to COVID. Um, we've seen the public service at its best. And, and for me, it just reinforces the fact that we've got all of these people here who are committed um, and bring a spirit of service to their work. Uh, and I go back to what I said really early on, it's almost as if you just need to get out of their way sometimes and let them express that. And so a lot of the apparatus that we have around the public service, I think does get in the way. This notion that you have to motivate people by targets and measurement and um, reporting and that sort of thing, um, I, I, I think doesn't work so well in the public service. If you can tap into that motivation and, and work with it, dance with it, then magical things happen. People are here for all the right reasons. They're not here just to make a buck. You know, they can go, they've got the choice to do that anywhere. They choose to do, do that here. And so, you know, I like to think that our understanding of leadership and organisations and people in the public service um, gets a little bit better each time. I just come from a meeting of secretaries this morning, a board that I chair. Um, we were trying to get people joined up at the regional level, and we've just basically decided to get out of their way. You know, give... <laughs> Talk to, talk to them about the targets, give them a mandate and step back and kind of get out of their way and let the spirit of service express itself and hopefully magical things happen. Thanks, Peter. We're getting some great questions here on the, in the chat, two, two that are really interesting. And I'm gonna throw this open to the whole panel. How do these issues that we're discussing, authenticity, integrity, accountability, participation, how, how do you think these intersect with issues of race and racism, which are big in, in, uh, in public debate right now, and also issues of gender? Um, what, is the, what is the intersection between, between gender and, um, and, the, and the, the, the subjects we're discussing right now? Anyone want to have a go at, at, at one of those? I'll have a go, James. Um, you can't lead in the public sector without public trust and confidence and you're not going to get public trust and confidence, you're not going to earn that if you don't reflect the communities that you serve. And so for me, diversity and inclusion in the public service is an absolute bottom line, and that's why we're putting so much focus on it here. We need to reflect the communities that we serve to earn their public trust and, and confidence. Mary, Sandra, any thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, part of what we have to do in public services always to make sure that we're talking to the whole community and not just to ourselves. And one of the um, interesting things um, about some of the debates that are going on at the moment in the UK, for example, the discussions there are about, you know, the, the need to, you know, this, the view that we have to have public servants all sort of centralised in one place and that they should all operate, you know, in the, in the capital city or, you know, that that's where the head offices are and there's all sorts of benefit in that. And there's discussions in the UK about whether that, that is of value, that, uh, you know, decentralised public servants having people, you know, outside of the centre can have some real value because you're dealing with, you know, real communities, real people, the full diversity is possible there, whereas it's not always possible if you're in Australia running everything out of, or the bulk of it out of Canberra, uh, in New Zealand, obviously with its own centralised approach. So that's a discussion. COVID's allowed some of that. People are working from home and they're not all, you know, having to be going into the centre and doing everything from there. So I think there's a discussion we need to have about that. If you want to engage, get the full diversity, we have to think about how we operate our public service as well, physically, not just, um, you know, in the ways that we um, discuss things with people or consult, we need to think about where we locate and, and who we're talking to. Thanks, Sandra. And you've gone to a really important issue that's come up in this series right through, which is getting closer to the people that you're delivering services for. And we've had some terrific conversation on that. Mary, let me ask you, we've got three minutes or so before we go to the chat rooms. Would we be better off? Would there be more humility if there were more women in, in positions of leadership in government and in politics? 
I personally think um, uh, we would we would have better decision making across the board if there were more women and reflecting the conversation um, and more people from diverse cultures and races um, uh, at the table. Um, now, whether you know, and, and I chose carefully my words when I talked about Jacinta Ardern in terms of her response being very human one, not necessarily a feminine one. And I think, um, you know, a lot of these characteristics are attributed to women, um, but uh, I don't think it's limited um, in any way to women. And I think men can um, easily, and, and for many, uh, not easily, but many do have uh, exactly the same sort of empathetic um, responses and feelings. And I think, um, so yes, better decision-making, uh, better outcomes with a diverse range of um, voices um, as part of decision-making, um, but I don't think it's just limited to women. I think there are um, uh, many other benefits that, that come and and the humility aspect can come from from uh, from all. It might just come in a, in a different uh, context or perspective. Thanks, Mary. We've got about a minute to go. Peter, can I get you very quickly? We've got a comment here from Jill who says, perhaps it's time to revisit recruitment. Let's move from a focus on academic achievement to mm. valuing lived experience of people on the ground mm. who have produced results. What are your quick thoughts on that comment? Well, if, if you're running, you know, if, you, if you're running a diverse and inclusive organisation, pretty much you're doing a lot of that um, in the first place. So absolutely agree. I mean, I think the way we think about what we need to do these roles needs to shift. Um, and some of those, you know, really basic skills and understandings that, that come from experience, the experience of lived, you know, lived experience in particular are, are absolutely relevant, absolutely relevant. Thanks, Peter. We're going to go to our chat rooms now, but let's, I just want to uh, relay a comment from Robert Pease, which I think is terrific. Coming back to your comment, Mary, about the 2% is the bit that kills you. Uh, Robert Pease has said, um, the, how do we address this culture of fear? You know, even if it's 2%, that's the bit that's gonna drive what you do. So let, we won't discuss that now, but it's something we might think about when we come back after the, uh, after the chat rooms. I think it's a really important part of this conversation. I've just come from a terrific conversation uh, with, um, two public servants, one from New Zealand, one from Australia. And it was really interesting in terms of the discussion that we started about, about race that our New Zealand participants said that in the Treaty of Waitangi, one of the requirements is that people in positions of leadership are quiet and listen when, when, uh, when there are important negotiations going on. That, that struck me as a way of integrating a different perspective into decision making. Peter, any thoughts about that in, from the New Zealand perspective? Um, I think that's exactly the style of leadership that we're talking about. I mean, as a leader, you get your authority from the people that you are leading. Um, and so your ability to listen carefully and be in touch with them and their views and thoughts and concerns and issues is your ability to earn their respect and therefore your ability to lead. Yes. And... Uh... Can you give us an example yourself? Tell, tell me about uh, something in your own role where you've actually had to do that and perhaps one where it was, where it was difficult. I mean, just if I can jump in, Peter, your Patterson oration, it's really interesting to hear you talk about when you started as a public servant and the first thing that you did was to go and interview um, single mothers about their, about their benefit and how you learnt from that, that face-to-face -face interaction with mm. the recipients of services was a big, uh, was, was important for you. But you might have a different example, but I was struck by that as a powerful one. Mm. Well, um, I, I started going right back, um, as you can see from my lack of hair and all the rest of it. Um, I started on the front line of our welfare department here, right at the very front, I was a in those days, a basic grade clerk, which was right at the very bottom of the food chain. Um, and I was also at university at the same time. In fact, I was uh, doing a law degree. Um, and ultimately, I dropped out of the law degree because I just couldn't see myself being a lawyer. Um, but I, I felt that the work I was doing was really mean, meaningful. And, you know, the example that you're giving was really the turning point for me. I had this fantastic job where I got to go into the 
homes of sole parents on, on benefit. And in those days, there was quite a lot of prejudice about um, those women in our country. Uh, and what I saw was a different reality. I saw people um, caring and struggling and um, um, deeply uh, wanting to bring up their kids the best way that they, they could. And for me, that was just a huge privilege. Uh, and I did a lot of listening and a lot of learning. Um, and that was the turning point for me. Um, and so I always kind of reference back to that. Um, and so to get things right in the leadership sense in the public service, where you're navigating across the whole of society and all sorts of constituencies and in interest groups, listening is a key skill, absolute key skill. Really interesting. Thanks, Peter. A comment from Estelle Parker. Sandra, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. In Estelle's group, they discussed how the secretary model doesn't necessarily promote humble leadership. A cult mentality can develop. Secretaries can surround themselves with yes people and often lose the ability to be, to be self-aware and, and to be authentic in the way we've talked about. Is that a fair comment, Sandra? Uh, look, it is a fair comment. I was, um, I was actually in that group, and one of the things I shared was that when I was um, when I got this role as a you know CEO equivalent, um, and, and somebody I trust enormously said to me, you know, you need to be very careful when you become the head of an, any agency because people stop telling you what they think; uh, they will tell you what you want to hear. And you can start to think that you know it all and they nod every time uh, that you say something. And you need to be very careful because it's a real trap that you can get into of kind of believing your own publicity, if you like. Uh, and you do need to get people around you and who will tell you what's really going on. And that is within the agency, but also outside the agency. Uh, that you are regularly talking about what you're doing, that you're regularly uh, discussing it with others, you're checking it past others and that you avoid and you, you basically systematically avoid this cult of, of the boss or the leader or the guru uh, because it is it is a bit of a trap. And I think that's part of the issue I raised before about when secretaries are all centralised in one area, they, they start to just talk to each other a fair bit uh, and that can be, um, you know, sort of self-selecting and self-congratulatory and it's we're all human. It can easily, it just, we naturally will go there, I think. So we've got to actively avoid it and actively avoid that status and cult and the thing that goes with it. And that, and that is exactly, as Peter was saying, keep getting back to talking to real people and real people in the community and, uh, you know, just keep on consulting and being aware of what's really going on uh, amongst your staff and also uh, in the community, of course, that you serve. Thanks, Sandra. Mary, you've um, probably experienced the same thing in government as, as, as what Sandra is talking about in public servant in service. If you have, how do you respond? Oh, absolutely exactly the same for the minister, but maybe um, even more so. Um, and I actually think the public service has a, a, a crucial role, um, the secretary, but, you know, the through the levels of the public service in terms of um, helping um, the minister to have that perspective and reality, uh, creating opportunities. Um, you know, I think, I think some ministers choose to um, draw themselves back into their office and, and not go beyond that. Um, and I think it's really important for the um, secretary and, and beyond to be driving those opportunities for the minister to get exposed if it's not something that they're choosing to do themselves. Now, you know, some and, and many will, but, but some don't. Um, and they get caught up in the, uh, you know, being called minister, the, you know, the big car and, uh, you know, and parliament, you talk about secretaries being together, parliament's a, you know, a classic example of that where, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it's very um, insulated to, to uh, those um, within your party and, and so on. So um, uh, there's no doubt better decision making um, comes um, from that exposure and that perspective. Um, and I think the public sector have a critical role in their relationship through to the minister um, to, for that to happen. 
Mary, let me keep it with you for a second. We're getting some interesting comments about fear. The, the conversation that you started at the very start of this webinar, a number of people have said that fear is rife in the public sector. It's much more than 2%, um, you know, the 2% being the mistakes that you might make. I wonder if you could tell us in your public life, did you experience fear? And if you did, how did you respond? So I, um, I had a real passion for reform. Uh, and I've got to say what I got mostly was people telling me to slow down and stop um, to that it was that we were doing too much, um, which I understood as well. But uh, there's no doubt, even in a four year term, the, it, it flies by and there's very little time when you do the policy development process um, as well throughout that. Um, so you know, we were, we were making changes right up to within weeks of, you know, Parliament being prorogued and so on, um, despite an environment where actually people were, were telling me not to. Um, as it turned out, it was a good thing because the government changed and, you know, then, then the opportunity is gone. Um, so, but I think it's very personally driven. Um, and we do see people who are um, crippled by that fear. I think one of the things I was pleased to be able to create is an environment where um, you know, we wanted ideas, we, we you know, wanted to reform. Um, you know, I had community services, obviously a big, a big welfare agenda and lots of opportunity for change there. Um, but uh, there was resistance. And I think, I think it actually comes down to manage risk, mm. uh, that you can make, um, you, you, can, you can make decisions with the best information, with a lot of thought having gone in, you know, these are not ad hoc and, and um, willy-nilly decisions. It's, it's based on your best decisions you can. So um, that fear can be managed by, by good policy work, um, you know, good advice, testing it broadly with those who, uh, if it hasn't been developed by those who are impacted on it, testing it um, with those who are, who are impacted by the decisions. Um, so you can, you can manage the downside uh, and create that environment for change. Peter, what are your thoughts about fear? Um, your work? Look, I think the reality is um, being able to effectively manage risk in a public sector environment is part of the art of being an effective public servant. Um, you have to get good at it because, um, you know, the public are, well, the, the media and the commentators are very unforgiving um, of mistakes. Now, part of that is how you respond when things go wrong, and part of it is actually managing risk. And I always say you, what we want is risk awareness, not risk aversion. Like, you don't get very far without taking risks. You don't learn much if you don't take risks and make mistakes. Um, so it's about how you respond when things go wrong, but it's also getting good at managing risk in a, you know, in a weird way, not in a, in a verse way. James, I just want to change the subject a little bit um, and go back to uh, people who exemplify leading with humility. If people want a Google search, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, he's our Director General of Health here, and he's led um, a large part of the COVID response. And uh, there's almost a cult following uh, around Ashley here. And if people want a Google search, for me, he absolutely exemplifies leading with humility and leading from a spirit of service. So I'll just drop that in. Sorry right. to break your um, chain of discussion. No, no, it's great. And he's come up a lot, actually, and come up in our chat as well. Sandra, let me ask you, there's a comment here um, from one of our participants saying that, in fact, we might discuss these things, but actually humility and empathy are not rewarded in the public service. Uh, the promotions and opportunities tend to favour those people who promote themselves, who have traditional sort of strength capacities. Uh, we might talk about this as much as, you know, we can talk about it as much as we like, but in fact, the reality is different. What do you think? Um, I yeah, I mean, I think that's not been my experience. Um, I'd certainly, I I'd certainly understand the sentiment because that's that can be uh, what it looks like, and that's certainly the case in some areas. But we, I suppose, when you talk about the public service needing to reflect the general population and the clients we deal with, well, so we're also going to reflect that as well—the the, the pros and cons, the goods, the bads, the 
poor behaviours, the good behaviours. You know, we're not going to be perfect. And I, I would say one of the things that um, I would, you know, I always try and encourage people in the public service is to, is to speak up but not be disappointed when our leaders are not perfect either. Um, we are human. We get things wrong, and we are going to we are going to reflect that you know that general. So we're going to have the same you know negative traits as as are out in the general community. I think sometimes the the expectations of public servants are that their leaders should always be perfect, um, but they make mistakes too, and they need to be forgiven. Um, on the other hand, I also think there's a there's an o sometimes an over politeness in the public service, which means that um, we don't raise issues when we should always, and we don't sort of build allies around raising issues. So there's, a, you know, this sort of um, fear of conflict uh, might be part of the problem. And it, I'd like to say that we should encourage people to speak up and, you know, say when they're not happy and raise issues a bit more than they uh, may feel that they can. Uh, it's not a perfect answer, but I, but I, I think um, I've certainly worked with a lot of really, really, really good people, and I wouldn't want to work anywhere else than in the public service. So I do want to leave uh, with a sense of hope, rather than um, it's all a bit too hard. Thanks, Sandra. Peter, Sandra's raised a really interesting point about uh, is there too much politeness and and at times fear of conflict in the public service. I. I was a public servant for just 16 months, but that was my impression as an outsider coming in, that sometimes there was a little too much politeness, perhaps. What do you think? Um, yes, um, I, I, think the, I think the public service is jam-packed full of passionate people, really, and they really, really care about what they're trying to do here. So sometimes you kind of have the reverse, as people, you know, debate positions and they express their their passion and um, I, I just think that's great when that happens mm. uh, because the work's really important it matters you know what we do makes a difference mm. so mm, yeah mm, I, I've kind of seen <laughs> I've kind of seen the reverse <laughs> can, I, can I also say James I, I just think can I encourage from a public sector perspective as well um, to not feel like you have to necessarily have all the answers by the time it goes to the minister's office as well. I mean, mm. I we ended up I ended up you know bringing teams up to have that debate together mm. um, because you know if you if you want ministers who actually understand the policies, the genesis, the the nuances. Yeah in terms of their decision making, um, they need to understand that debate rather than just have the brief that, you know, mm. uh, ties it up with a bow at the end. Um, and mm. so once again, some of that might be, yeah. you know, some might welcome it, but some some of that might be educating in terms of that process yeah. of this is a useful way to do, go about it. Yeah. Mary, let's, while you're speaking, can I get a quick reflection from you on what's going on in Victoria at the moment with COVID-19? We've had um, the Public Service Department, Health and Human Services, having to implement a hard lockdown of nine public housing towers. Very stressful situation uh, for the residents, but also in a different way for the people who had to implement that, that lockdown. Uh, we've had the quarantine hotels um, episode. You've been following this. I wonder what your thoughts are in terms of, of those episodes, how, how you feel you know, was there, could they have been handled differently? Are some of the things that are coming up in this discussion about, you know, accepting responsibility for mistakes, are they relevant here? What, what are your thoughts? I, I think it's very relevant. And I think, um, I think the, the government's response to not address some of the failures on what is proving, you know, what, what seems to be proving to be a fundamental cause of why we're back in lockdown mark two um, and reflecting instead on a, you know, saying oh, it's gone to the judicial inquiry has actually been, um, you know, the, the issue where trust has been lost. Um, you know, I, th I actually think if the government had been travelling very well despite the challenges, um, but that inability to, to continue to be genuine and, and open and transparent and, and deflect it to something that's going to report in three months' time um, has actually caused what I referenced earlier, sort of some of the drop in um, 
uh, in the polls and, and, and the views of the community in relation to it. Um, and I think it's unusual because the Premier usually uh, is a very good communicator and, and can grasp those sort of situations. Um, and so I think that's a classic example of um, how not to respond um, in the context of what we're talking about today. Well, it comes back to the um, the own it, fix it, learn it, learn from it, uh, um, a mantra that's been raised in this um, in this webinar. We've, we've only got about three minutes left, so can you? I'm going to ask each of you to to just sum up for about a minute or so your thoughts about this conversation. What did what did you take away from it, and uh, how can we all learn to act uh, to to lead with humility or to act with uh, greater humility in our roles? Sandra, can I start with you? Um, yes, it's been it's been really good to hear my other panel members and and the small group that I went into as well was really interesting um, and useful. Thank you. Um, I think it, what I'm hearing is people need to be it's it's about um, being conscious of the views in the community, uh, consulting with others, giving people room to have views, encouraging that view. I really loved what Mary said about inviting public servants up to the minister's office to discuss and debate issues. In my experience, uh, that happened with, you know, quite a few ministers that I really still remember and really respect. I think it's a, an amazing thing to, to do that. Uh, if we can encourage more of that and, you know, have ministers have the confidence and their staff to be open to that, I think um, that would be a really positive thing. Um, but I really also um, valued what Peter was saying about the you know, what's great about being a public servant and why we're here and that we're passionate about it and, uh, you know, it's worth fighting for and, you know, that consulting and getting views uh, is such a powerful thing. Oh, well said, Sandra. That's great. Um, Peter, can I get you to conclude? Um, well, let's recognise and value our public servants. Let's, let's recognise, respect... Um, and value the spirit of service that they bring to their work, uh, because for me it all it starts and ends with that. Um, and the way to do that is through authentic leadership, um, where you're leading from your authentic self. Well said, thanks, Peter. Mary, your your last thought. I think my last thought is that we've got to grasp the opportunity we have at hand right now. Um, the, the change occurs when there's a burning platform, when there's there's a crisis, um, and there's no doubt, you know, we haven't seen anything like <laughs> we're in now uh, ever before. So if we want to embed um, some of the benefits and some of the positives we've seen in terms of, you know, openness, transparency, empathy, um, pushing down decision making, uh, engagement. Then we need to we need to take what what we're seeing now and and um, use that opportunity to translate it uh, into broader everyday practice rather than returning to whatever new, the, you know making it the new normal rather than uh, returning it to the old and that is then reinforced not only in our own practice but but through the media um, and and uh, in in the way we operate generally thanks Mary I think it's fascinating to to think about how uh, this crisis has made it very difficult to be in government but also Funnily enough, has opened up opportunities to do things differently, and and I was fascinated by the discussion that I think Peter opened about uh, about different forms of personality and and how to be authentic uh, as a human being inside government and public service. So thank you all. Thanks to our panel, to Mary, to Peter, and to Sandra.